What's good, everybody, and welcome to a special episode of the What's Good Games podcast. This is our very first new format review episode. <gasps> I feel like this is where Brittany. Oh, by the way, I'm Andrea Renee, joined by the blonde <laughs> wonder, Brittany Brombacher. Oh, the blonde wonder. God, I love that. Mm. Yes, it's true. Mm. You are. Um, so, Brittany, in all of the years that we've been doing What's Good Games, We've been pretty open about the fact that we don't technically review games. We don't score games. We don't really criticize and analyze games for review, but we call them reviews because algorithms and SEO. And yeah. some people are mad about that and other people don't care. I think it's bold to get mad about that you can still review something without giving it a little score we just give you all the pieces and you can score it in your head you know what I mean I might say I like the color blue Andrea says I hate blue therefore that game is a one out of ten I'm like I love blue so it's a ten out of ten that's fine it's still a review I still told you it was blue right right you I did it sounded good in my head, that, that <laughs> logic. We're going to workshop that analogy, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, so Brittany and I are here today because, as you are probably aware, as the embargo has lifted, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is about to descend upon your eye holes and your fingers, and we're here to talk about it. We, oh my God, dude. Uh, yeah, you know, when you said descend... I had never run, you want to get it here. Let's just lay this on the table. I say you want to get it because like you never played the original Final Fantasy seven. You know, I didn't. I mean? So I think this would be a good time for us to, first of all, thank Square Enix for the review codes. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us so much time to play this game. Um, you have played Final Fantasy seven remake. That <clears> is your only experience, correct? Yes. Well, I dabbled in Final Fantasy 15. Okay. I under, the guidance of when Alexa Ray Korea played the remaster of Final Fantasy IX yeah. on PS4 and was like, what is this game? It's so weird. Remember, I, I didn't realize my critical error. I renamed the characters because you could do that. And I was like, this was a mistake. Should not have done that at all. Why are you letting me rename the characters? I'm so confused. Um so that was my Final Fantasy experience. I have played a tiny bit of 14, but overall pretty not up to speed on the entire Final Fantasy franchise, right? Um, that's definitely more of your expertise. But I was completely blown away by Final Fantasy VII Remake, and it went on to be my favorite game of the year that year. Shocking everybody, I think. Like, oh my God. I remember. Can't believe yeah. Andrea like, loves this game. And it was in the What's Good Game Awards that year. It was my game of sleepless nights, most sleepless nights, because I was up all hours of the night just, you know, traversing around Midgar. Um, mm -hmm. Just having a grand old time with my buddy Aerith. Um, and I just really loved what they did and the story that they told. And more importantly, the way that they allowed gameplay to have flexibility for both old fans and new and people who are more action focused like I am. I'm like, I don't really want to do turn-based stuff, guys. And they're like, good news, you don't have to. And I was like, awesome. But you can, <laughs> and you can do both. And that's cool, too. Um, so was really a big fan of it. And so when they announced what we were calling episode two, right? That's what we thought mm -hmm. it was going to be. And then they're like, actually, we're going to name it Rebirth. I was like, yeah, still finally. Hate that word. Let's still go. hate that word. It, makes, it just makes me feel icky. Rebirth. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, yeah, so when then it comes, like Andrea said, when it comes to my expertise with Final Fantasy, I obviously love the remake. I actually just finished the remake, um, about two weeks before we got our codes for Rebirth. So that was really good timing. I needed a refresher, if you will. And I played the original Final Fantasy VII from start to finish two times. But, um, and I know that because I've only finished it for the first time just a few years ago. And then just kind of leading up to this, I dabbled again and, and reacquainted myself with some things. So should we just get right into this then? You ready to hop into this bad boy? I'm so ready. Let's do it. Okay, let's do it. So yeah, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is the sequel to Final Fantasy VII Remake. And the game picks up, if you've played the original game, it picks up with everybody in Calm. Now, this happened, the town of Calm, spelled with a K. This happens right after the crew leaves Midgar at the end of the original Final Fantasy, sorry, of the original Final Fantasy VII remake. Everyone leaves Calm, the, er, everyone leaves Midgar, the game ends. In this game, you are now outside of Midgar, you've traveled to the town of Calm, and then it 
kind of just takes narrative narratively from there. And it does follow, you know, kind of this the, the general steps you would imagine this narrative to take if you have played the original. But again, because this whole thing, this whole game where all of us fans can't wrap our head around is what is going to happen narratively. What's going What's on gonna, with Daddy Sephiroth? So what I, is going on? I, I, I want to call up before we get in. Of course, we're going to make this spoiler free. Will we do a spoiler cast at some point? Yes. Hopefully. Will we invite Alexa Ray to come back for it? Absolutely. Is she going to be able to make it? Who knows? She's a busy gal. Um, but I vividly remember playing the end of Remake and going, what on earth happened at the end of this game? Because I was following along very well with the story all the way through until the very end. And then I was like, what on earth just happened? Oh Who God. is this Sephiroth guy? What What's going on with these whisper things? Like, I mean, the whole like Shinra Mako storyline, I, I, I'm getting it all. And now it's just like, now the weird sets in. And so this <laughs> game picks up like pretty much immediately after that. And you do get some backstory, which, you know, we'll leave undisclosed. You know, talking about like, you know, why Sephiroth was at the end of Remake and you know, how he's going to play out or what we think is going to happen. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not very far into the game. Spoilers. Um, and I just, like, remembered being, like, I'm still so confused. <laughs> That's the thing is this Final Fantasy VII narrative is just, like, the original narrative confusing as hell. This new <laughs> timeline, like, it's boggling my mind. I, it, It's absolutely cuckoo bananas. Um. But yeah, like you said, going to keep this absolutely spoiler free. So speaking as someone who knows the narrative, or at least I think I know the narrative, um, I loved how Rebirth kept me on my toes during this, during my time playing it. Um, and you never knew what was going to happen. You never knew what was around the corner. And it could be something as minor as maybe a town has a brand new mayor that never existed before. Or maybe a character from a spinoff game makes an appearance in a town you never really expected them to. Or it could be something as absolutely major as an entire sequence happening out of order. Things not happening the way they should. Characters getting introduced in a brand new way. Major characters. And it... It is a mind fuck. That's all I'm going to say. And I literally would lay awake at night in bed, like thinking like, what does this mean? What's going to happen? What's going to happen in the next game? And that for me is so freaking cool because I mean, you do worry about that, right? You do worry about, I think I know where this narrative is going. How fun is it really going to be to experience this and then this and then this and then this? Obviously, you know, it, it's beautiful and shiny and new, but narratively, like, what's the excitement there? Well, don't worry about it, friends. You think you know what's going to happen. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. It is absolutely bonkers and very, very fun to experience. So I really did love that about the story. Um, the other thing, too, and I think what plays into that is everything has been reimagined. So, of course, like... You know, I think we've all seen Junon now and that we were pre that's the area we previewed, Andrea, was Junon when you mm. and I did it back in the day. Junon originally under Junon, which is this little teeny tiny like four house little village that you could explore in probably five to ten minutes, right? But now it is this sprawling like port city little rad area and there's so many shops and people and side quests and things to do and brand new characters and new introductions and it's, it's just that is one example of what you're going to experience in this game. And that is just, and they pulled it off, I think, so incredibly well. And that doesn't just apply to cities. It applies to dungeons. It applies to characters. I will say there were, from a pacing perspective, a few of these reimagined areas and sequences that probably could have been scaled down. Or as I like to say, it could have received the this could have been an email treatment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. It's a lot to take in for somebody who isn't familiar with the original game and who got hooked like I did from Remake. Um, and even just in the opening sections of the story, and I was just like, okay, there's clearly a lot more going on here. And I, I made the comment that if they hooked me with like the intro storyline in Remake, they're bringing out all of the Final Fantasy weird in Rebirth. Like, from the jump, there's, like, all kinds of things that are really iconic Final Fantasy stuff, like like uh, Moogles, right? Like, yes. 
and you know him like jumping around and calling you Koopa over and over again, um, stuff like that. And then you know obviously like the chocobos, which oh my god, the the cuteness of the baby chocobos. And I know we they're saw them in the butts. early trailer with the nut butts, mm -hmm. but they're just so cute. I just want one. That's a really good point. I'm glad you bring that up because this is a Final Fantasy ass Final Fantasy game. This is like what Final Fantasy would be in 2024 right with those sprawling landscapes the final fantasy magic the moogles the chocobos the weirdness that fantasy of it all like it's all here and i think that's something that i really really appreciate but i am curious because midgar was pretty centered all things considered you know pretty level but now it's like in your face welcome bitch we got you this is final fantasy and then they punch you in the back of the head i mean they do and the way that it's so seamlessly woven into the gameplay and the quest lines really needs to be appreciated because I think it would be so jarring in a lot of other games to, you know, have some of these moments, but the characters react and like, I didn't think anything of it because I was like, oh, it's just the world of Final Fantasy. I love that like deadpan cloud is back because that was one of my favorite things from Remake. Uh, some of his dialogue lines where he's just got this like really straight face and he's clearly with all of these wacky characters and he's just like, yeah. What a, what the hell, man? And I'm just like, oh my God, Cloud, the man of few words. So he is great. the best. I love Cloud too. And he does open up quite a bit in this game. And it's interesting, you know, again, no spoilers here, but knowing what I know about him and who he is as a character and the things he's faced, it's, it's again, like, I love that there's something there for everybody. Andrea can appreciate Deadpan Cloud, and then I can dig really deep into all of that and overanalyze, like, what's going on. And... Speaking of characters, this is kind of fun. There's a new bonds of friendship mechanic. And I don't know, Andrew, have you unlocked this yet? Um, not yet. So okay. I am, I mean, I'm working towards that. Like I, is it, is that what the smi like the little smiley yeah. face? Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. so, so I do know what that is. Yes. Okay. So this is brand new. And in the original Final Fantasy VII, there was an affinity system. However, that was mostly based off of dialogue choices that you made with your companions, and you never really knew where someone stood with you. So, it, you know, that's why all these guides are written. If you want to take Tifa on this iconic date sequence that happens in the game, happened in the original, it's probably going to happen in the remake. I don't know why I'm saying it like this. Like, I don't know. Um, but you now can have a you have a clear idea of how people feel, feel about you by pressing l1 so you do that everyone gets little smiley faces above their head you know they start off like pretty meh and then like if you really get them going they're gonna have big old beaming grins on their face and then you're gonna know they really love you uh so how you can raise your affinity with these members are you can just make dialogue choices with them when you're chatting there's some moments of leisure where you can just walk around and talk to people uh, and then though this is what i think is so fun this time around the there are these side missions and um, look for the green icons when you're playing the game. But essentially, each region has their own their own side missions. And as you take these on, party members are written into the narrative, right? So maybe you'll do something with Yuffie where you're training someone in ninjutsu. Or maybe when you're with Tifa, or maybe a side quest will make you go find ingredients with Tifa for her, her famous Cosmo Canyon, right? And so you get a really good look at these characters, and they really flourish. And you get, like, a really great sense of who they are and as you do these missions you gain xp but then you also deepen your friendship with them and the whole point of this entire system is quote it can alter portions of the story obviously like i said the gold saucer day is one of the most iconic ones square has talked about that publicly um and now you'll kind of have a better idea of who is more favored to go with you based off how much they like you. And so I just think that's really fun. I love, always love this cast of characters. They are all so different and troubled and unique in their own ways. But we never really got a real good deep dive into who they are and what kind of people they are outside of, you know, the PlayStation game. And there were some books and other spinoff media as well. But in this one, man, like, I feel like I know them better than ever. I feel like we're actually all friends now. And it's something that I just really appreciate. Square took the time to really flesh these people out. Yeah, there's so many really interesting characters. I do think that it kind of got just, like, a shit ton of bricks of content dropped on you all at once very quickly. So... To give some perspective, because I had a very sick child when the review codes came in, and then I immediately following that had to go to DICE, and then I came back and was like, I need to furiously play as much of this game as humanly possible. 
crazy knowing that it's massive. Um, I didn't get as far into the game as I would have liked before this conversation, but we wanted to get this up at embargo. Um, I'm about 10 hours in, so like just scratching the surface of this game, and I'm still in the opening grasslands area, and already there are all kinds of gameplay mechanics. So there's oh, the... Yeah. Chocobo stops. There's the command assignments that Chad gives you. There's the, what I'm going to dub the Ubisoft Chadley. towers <laughs> that you have to go around and you get them and they put intel on your map. There's the summons, like special mm -hmm. religious uh, cave things. I can't remember the exact name of them. This, like the spiritual caverns. The shrines. Yeah, yeah, The yeah. shrines. Yes. Like, I mean, where you have to do like the little sort of like a it's like a it's a mini game but it's like a memorization like simon says kind of yeah kind of kinda. um so there's like a mini game there and then you also need to go on you know these multi-step side quests and then you learn about how to use your transmuter and then you learn about how to upgrade your weapons and then how to get materia and how to upgrade materia and like my head was just like yeah i was like okay I just got to be full sponge right now and try to just take in as much as possible. And I appreciate that the team at Square Enix put a very comprehensive manual in the pause menu. It literally says manual, like a game manual. And I was like, God bless you. I, this is what I need. I don't need like, like, a, like a codex with all of these deep cut lore things. I think that there's a place for that. But what I need is you to tell me how to do literally everything in the game after you've just told me how to do it because I missed it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm glad you, yeah, glad you brought that up. There, it is a lot, and I think earlier I called it Simon Says. I was talking about Simon. You know, like the little like glowy game that you can. Yeah, like, push the yeah, 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 exactly. That's what where those the colors me. light up and you have to match them in order. Yeah. Yes, baby. Uh, yeah, this game is a lot. There is so much in it. In fact, I think about I think I was like the forty or fifty hour mark. Where I was like, I still don't totally understand how all of these mechanics work, but I'm winning and I'm doing good. So I'm just going to assume that I'm doing good enough. And then that's just kind of the mentality I had to have because otherwise it can be overwhelming. And I had the benefit of just, you know, finishing Final Fantasy VII Remake again, like a couple of weeks prior. So a lot of that was still fresh in my head. But that would be a good piece of advice to give to someone. Just be patient. Don't feel too overwhelmed. I think it does a good job at you know, making it easy to do good at first with all these mechanics, but then eventually, you know, as you continue on with the story and the narrative and things get more difficult, depending on what difficulty you're on, you're going to have to get good at all the mechanics. Um, and, you know, that's that's a whole nother topic. So we could go in two ways right now, Andrea. I think I want to speak back to what you were talking about, which was the overworld and all of the stuff to do. So the Grasslands area is the first area that you enter, obviously, upon leaving Calm. That's, again, it's been in the demo. It's public knowledge. And that is just one of the regions. There are probably, I can't, I can't remember, five, six regions in this game. And they're all fairly massive. And they all have their its own unique terrain, its side missions, its type of chocobos, uh, side quests. I already said that one. And I will say, like, as someone who is familiar with these areas, it is such a dopamine rush to go in there and play these and get in there and explore because you never really, again, like I was saying earlier, you never know what you're going to find, but it's familiar enough that you kind of know what you're going to anticipate. And then when you come across those iconic locations, you're like, oh, this is so fucking cool. And the soundtrack in this game, the remixed tracks of some of these most like iconic, oh my God, it's so freaking good. So, so good. So I do want to say like dopamine was flowing like water as I traverse these areas. They're just gorgeous to be in. And they're very fun. And it's really cool to see the world of Final Fantasy VII expanded in such a grand way. That said, I did find myself feeling a little bit like I was going through a slog after I was two to three regions deep. Because each one, while it does have all those unique things that I mentioned earlier, they do have all the same. Activate the towers, defeat the enemies, find the artifacts, activate the shrines. And that, after a bit, felt a little repetitive and... A piece of advice I would give to players is before you get to that point in the game where it's like, you might want to tie everything up, don't save all of this stuff for the end. Try to pace yourself, especially if you want to do everything. Try to take it on a little bit out of a time at a time because otherwise, like I got to that point in the game and I'm like, I need to do everything right now. And it was just kind of a grind. 
You know what I mean? It was a bit of a grind. But if you're going to do two of the things in these open world maps, my friends, I implore you to do the side missions, again, because you're going to deepen your relationships with your with your party members, and do the proto-relic missions. Narratively, you're going to get the most out of it if you do those. But, I mean, the other stuff isn't, like, egregious. It's just, like, ugh, it's just a little repetitive. Yes. I do appreciate that at the very beginning when you meet Chad and he kind of sets you off on this collect Chadley. all of the marker things um Chadley yes yeah, sorry um that Aerith is like because because Cloud is like I don't have time for this we have to get going and Aerith is like you know uh it's gonna take money for us to get going and you know what we don't have is money so we should probably do some of these things for people who are gonna pay us money and I was like, you know, I appreciate that they made a narrative beat to acknowledge that they're about to dump a bunch of like <laughs> busy work on you. <laughs> yes. And you're supposed to be having this kind of, you know, big narrative reason why you're, you know, pushing through the grasslands into the next area, into the next area. And then, you know, they said, but actually, you know, you're going to need to level up. You're going to grind that this is an RPG after all. And boy, when I got to the first major boss battle, was it a uh, kick in the teeth to remind me that, oh, yeah, you know, if you want to fight this boss and not just get crumpled instantly and go through all of your potions in approximately 30 <laughs> seconds, you're going to have to go back out there and do some of that side content. You know, it's part of the part of the process. And I was like, man, I felt like I did a lot, though. I just want to I want to get to the next thing. But I yeah. do appreciate that the fast travel system is incredibly generous. Yes. And you can get around very quickly on Chocobo. Was it so silly watching them all run around on Chocobos? Oh, my God. Yes, it's, but I love it so best. much. It reminds me of when we did the preview and we watched Red 13 get on a Chocobo. And oh it was God. just the best. It's just, just the best. Just so. It's an abomination. So silly. I, I don't know. I can't stop looking at him when he's on a Chocobo. It's like, this doesn't make any sense, but it does. But that's fine. Yeah. Uh, he's, yeah. yeah. We'll talk about, we'll talk about Red later. He's, he's a, he's a character. He, him and Barrett's banter back and forth is just the fucking it's best. It's so it good. Is, there's so many good, like, one-liners in this game, oh. too. Like, the, there's a. A line from a character on a side quest you meet re really early in the game that refers to Red as your dog. He's like, oh, can I pet your dog? And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> this is going to go bad. <laughs> it's just that ongoing bit. And I think that's where this game truly shines. Like I said, like I love the open world minus some of that repetitive stuff. And there is a little bit of bloat. And like the this could have been an email treatment here or there. But considering how massive this game is, like it is just so well done, I think, in so many different ways. And the characters like we were just talking about, like that's where it really shines. And we can't talk about the narrative and we can't talk about the characters. But like that is the thing that made me keep picking this game up and going back for more. Uh, oh, also that in Queen's Blood, the card game. Oh, I oh, oh my gosh, I was oh. like, okay, yes, oh. you go, you go first, and then I'll say my thoughts. <laughs> okay, so I generally, friends, am not a card person. Same. I'm just not. I instantly, the moment they were like card game, I was like, boo, boo. another yeah. card game, don't want. Mm -mm. I was like, this is not for me. This is going to make me think a lot. And I don't want to think. I just want to go see Daddy Sephiroth in the flesh. Um, I'm addicted to this game. Oh, Brittany, it's terrible. I've spent way too much time playing Queen's Blood and not out doing my business. Oh, I thought you meant it's terrible. Like you don't actually like it. I was like, no. Yeah. My obsession with this game is terrible. Oh, yeah. I'm 100% with you. I did not want to like this. It's bad for my <laughs> progression for me to like this. <laughs> But I like it. I love it. I did not understand it for the longest time. But then as I, I just kept playing and playing and playing. And then once it clicked, I'm like, oh, my God, I am a queen's blood queen. I am the master of it all. Uh, I buy every booster pack. I do every, you know, there's tons of little side missions you can do with it. I kick everyone's ass I come across. I think if I bring it on my PlayStation portal to bed, which, by the way, the PlayStation portal has been a godsend when it comes to reviewing this game. Because I can Ooh, say I little things. I haven't tried it yet. I got to do, do that. You got to do it. I mean, it plays the entire game great for me and Anyway, with the way my internet set up, but doing Queen's Blood stuff and doing side missions on the portal in bed has just been the fucking best. Except for it fills me with adrenaline and then I don't fall asleep. Uh, but no, Queen's Blood is great. I, I want an actual deck of these cards. I want to collect them all. I want to be the Queen's Blood master. You How know is I mean? this not going to become like its own mobile game, right? 
It has to. Like it Gwent, absolutely... you know, from Witcher, like, became its, like, its own entity. Oh, yeah. And can you imagine the PvP and going up against players? Like, that would just be so much fun. Anyway, it's fantastic. I could do a whole ass video about this. Uh, but speaking of the side stuff, there's... <laughs> so much i think i think square's motto for this game andrea was there's a mini game for that <laughs> see they're just taking a page out of the the yakuza on like a dragon book i and i love that i love that so much i mean this is the way the original was as well there are a ton of little silly mini games something as silly as wrangling chickens has its own mini game riding dolphins like there, there's just it just doesn't end and i think that's really great the other two major ones though that i spent a lot a lot of time with outside of queen's blood were the chocobo races and the Fort Condor stuff and you'll get there like but I had so much fun with both, all of them and those were all things that I didn't really love in the original one but I think they've been reinvented in a way that makes sense for my brain this time around and I just can't get enough and I love it because with the chocobo races you know you get your gear as you play you know when you go to the choco boutiques and you can buy new little cosmetics for your little chocobos with the feathers you get oh, so That's it is actually, just cosmetics right it's cosmetics when you're in the world but when it comes to your chocobo races baby you'll be you'll be gearing your chocobos up and that uh, impacts okay. their stats they don't really tell you that though at least i don't think they do no and then when they I, didn't really so i because i've been hoarding my golden plumes which you earn by activating chocobo rest stops and by wrangling wild mm -hmm. chocobos in the world um, and you know, petting the cute little baby chocobos. And I was like, do I want, I feel like I got to save them till there's better gear available at different chocobo ranches. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you progress through different regions, you're going to find, um, you know, different gear, but every gear, I think. Each piece of gear does something a little different. I don't know necessarily if like one piece of gear is better than another. It's just going to depend on how you want to race your chocobo. But don't hoard them. Definitely like as long as you plan on activating the stops, you'll get more than enough plumes for what you need. But um, or you could just hold on to them and then figure out what you want. I don't know when you buy them, though, if they show you the stats until you I don't think they do. Yeah, so. I'll show you that I have a Square Enix's team did a very good job of providing us with ample B-roll clips um for this conversation so i appreciate that oh chloe also chloe how cute is chloe she is so freaking cute there's so much great costume design in this game just very much into it so um this is the first chocobo ranch that you come across in the game and she's like hey you can you know buy stuff from me um and mm -hmm. then she's like also when you get these golden plumes out in the world you can go to this thing called the Choco Boutique um, and that. you can spend them and you can, you know, make your your little Chocobo buddy all cute. And I instantly was like, I need more stuff to buy. This is like a prime <laughs> example of like bad spender shopaholic <laughs> Andrea going, where's the premium Chocobo cosmetics that I can buy right now? <laughs> I can't I can't wait till 50 hours deep in the game for my chocobo to look cute as hell. It needs to look cute as hell from the jump and I will pay real world dollars for it. <laughs> well, and you know, that is something interesting to know. So every region has a different chocobo um, because each chocobo will be able to do different tasks, right? So the grassland one is just a basic ass bitch chocobo. It's, it goes around and it goes, quick, cool. Um, the one <laughs> in Junon can climb up walls. The hey, one you, you don't talk about Pico like that. I mean, Pico is very sweet. Pico's not a basic bitch I, chocobo. He kind of is, but I love him. I love that for him. You know, we don't all need to be a superstar. You You're know like, what I mean? wait, girl, till you get to the the, to the the good, good chocobos later on. There are just some silly chocobos, you, you like, know, Pico and I who? will. <laughs> Pico who? Um, each chocobo just, it, it gets around the terrain of that region. That's what it does. There's a chocobo maybe that it looks like it has water propelling out of its butt to get you around. It's a weird thing. You'll you'll find it someday. Oh, uh, okay. It, yeah, you know what I mean? It's a thing. Um, but So I wouldn't say that actually any is better than the other. It's just each Tokobo just is equipped to get around the way it needs to get around. And I'll just kind of leave it at that. But yeah, the Chocobo racing is so fun. Queen's Blood is an absolute blast for Condor. I mean, I, there were a few times, I will say, and this could be because I know where this, well, I think I know where the story is going. Where some of the padding, again, going back to that bloat I was mentioning, or when something suddenly becomes a mini game, like the wrangling chickens, there's a part where you have to like call, it's a side mission, but you have to call this lady's chickens back to her and how Cloud does that. You know, he's, this, you know, ex-soldier, but he can't wrangle chickens without a fucking chicken banger. So he like gets this chicken feed and he smacks it. 
And no, we actually he drags it. He drags it th- throughout the, the the ground, and it causes that clanging sound. And chickens are drawn to it. Like so you have to do this like three times, girl, through this for, through this one town. And I'm like, this this is silly, and it's it's kind of fun, and it does break up the gameplay. But I just want to get to the next narrative beat because I know what's going to happen. So that is something I was trying to be self aware of, of. Am I just being impatient because I know what next thing is awaiting me, or is this just really feeling a little bit like a slog and a little unnecessary? But yeah, I think it's a tough balance to strike for yeah. development teams because every player is different. Because I thought for sure when talking to some teams at Massive about the Division 2, and me being like, wow, it just felt like there was like so much stuff in there. It was just like too much to do. And them saying, really? Because we get a lot of complaints in our community forums that there's not enough to do. And I was like, what? How is that possible? So mm-hmm. ever since I had that conversation, which was what, like probably five years ago now, or maybe even longer, it like always ke- it has stayed in my mind that teams that do this kind of open world exploration, action adventure gameplay, like have this forever tug of war with their fan base of how much do we want to put in so that it feels like you have a lot to do, but that it's not like tedious to do all of these Mm -hmm. things Mm -hmm. that it feels fun and it feels like it's contributing to the overall gameplay and it doesn't feel boring or busy work and I think it was really great of you to mention that certain world activities have a really important impact on your overall game and that you should remember that and I wish the game communicated that more in the beginning So that you as a player could really decide how do I want my time in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth to play out? Do I really want to spend each region, time in each region, checking off all of the little dots of all of the things I have to do? Or is it more important for me to have a more balanced approach and then I can come back when I'm maybe I'm a bit more powerful, more experienced, know my party members better and how we synergize, right? That's the big thing, the synergy skills. We haven't talked about combat really at all yet about you know, what I want to do. And I do think that that's lacking, that communication about how that's going to unfold is lacking, which I'm not surprised about, but I wish was in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's it's that thing of I could talk to five other people who played this and maybe their experience was much, maybe they had more patience for this because of maybe what they had going on in their life. You know, I think I forget about that. As a parent and XYZ got a bunch of shit going on, I think my patience for monotonous tasks is just probably a lot lower than someone else's who has all the time in the world to play this game, you know? So that's something I try to be a little bit more self-aware of. It made me think of when you and I had talked about, I think your time playing um, Final Fantasy IX, because I know you're still, you know, holding out for the remake. And I had mentioned when I had played the remaster on PS4 that I turned all of the toggles for like speeding through encounters on. And you had made a point that when you were a kid, you were like, I had nothing else to do but do all of the encounters. So, like, you just did it and you just did the grind and did the grind because, like, that was just part of the game. And it's such a valid point that you bring up about how we grow and get older as gamers. Our priorities for what we want to spend our time inside of a game doing definitely change. And I absolutely look at it through that lens of, okay, I have probably two hours today to sit down and play this game realistically if I want to go to bed before 3 a.m. And so, (laughs) or you do what I did for a couple of nights in a row and you're like, listen, I'm just not going to sleep today. That's just the way it is. Um, And so it's like, how am I going to spend that time and feel like I'm actually making progress? And in a game like this that's so massive, it sometimes feels overwhelming. Yeah, amen. It's just, we're all getting older. Makes me miss having the days of no responsibilities. (laughs) Ah, Those days are so gone. Um, can you imagine being a kid now and having oh. all of the incredible video games that you can play now? I mean, shit, Dude, man. I think about Skyrim. That's the first game that comes to mind. Like, could you imagine? You could just wake up all day and be like, I'm just going to go fucking terrorize towns. And that's a productive day in my oh. life. Huh. The dream to wake the up dream. on a Saturday morning and go, I have nothing to do today but play 10 hours of video games. Yeah. Maybe oh. I will clothe myself. I'm definitely going to eat something. My parents you know. will bring me something, you know, when you were yeah. a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good times. Um, hmm. uh, let's talk about combat because now I'm feeling nostalgic for yes. my youth. Let's talk um, about combat. Let's talk about the combat. So it's very largely similar to what was in Final Fantasy VII Remake. 
However, there's a fun new wrinkle that Andrea talked about earlier, and that is the synergy skills and the synergy abilities. And so now as you level up your skill tree in Rebirth, which is now called the Folio, you will unlock these these skills. And so what's, what's really fun about them is it adds a whole new level of strategy. It makes the combat a lot more hectic, but I would say a lot more exciting, especially once you get the hang of it. So as you're playing, if you're playing on PS5, which of course we all are, you will press R1 and that is going to open up your synergy skills. And then these are skills that don't require an ATB charge. And they can do something as like as simple as a counterattack, right? So, and these also increase your your friendship levels with your party members, by the way, when you use them for the very first time. So there's a counterattack with Aerith that I have, for example, in my synergy skill. And so I can have like that prompt ready to go. And then I know as soon as I'm about to get hit with an enemy projectile, I'll execute that attack and then I'll do an awesome counterattack with Aerith. Like that's really fun. And it, it, it does give you a lot more options for um, combat, especially as you play on more difficult levels. Then you have the synergy abilities. And then this is now a new level, a new tab in your combat menu. And how you can use these is by executing other skills and abilities. And it'll tell you on your, I'm trying to keep this as concise as possible. It'll tell you which skills fill up your synergy ability bar. It's its own bar. And you have to fill that up to a certain extent before you can use those brand new synergy abilities. So Once you fill that up, then you can use these abilities with your party members as well. And again, they will also deepen your friendship levels the first time you use them. And these attacks are fucking awesome. (laughs) They are badass and they are so powerful. There's one where Cloud will like throw Tifa at an enemy like consensually. Um, There's the one that we also that went viral where Barrett and Aerith like have their sunglasses on together and everyone thought that was super cute and fun. These are just um, very powerful abilities that can inflict status effects. They can increase your ATB gauge to be three instead of two. There's just a lot of customization here and just depending on who you have in your party like the possibilities are quite literally endless. And the other thing too that is how do, I'm trying to remember how this works. It's skills. You also unlock skills in your folio, which gives you elemental attacks that do not require an ATB charge. So you're not limited to what spells you have. You can also use the skills. So Cloud can make his his sword go on fire. Now he has a fire ability, even if he doesn't have the MP for a fire skill. Like, here's the thing. This system is beautiful because it can be <laughs> as complex or as simple as you want it to be. And like, you know, Andrea was saying earlier, you can lower that difficulty down to baby ass baby mode. You can even make it turn like, you know, where your hands off again with that difficulty. Or you can go all the way max to kick my ass, please, daddy. I love this. Yeah, there's just a lot of customization here. It's and we so have even talked. I'm, I'm desperately trying to find some like good combat it's gameplay so in like all of these videos we have. And it's like, there's not like a ton, but I'm just going to pull from the trailer that they Godspeed. have. So if you're watching at on YouTube, um, you guys can and take a look at some of this stuff that Brittany has been talking about. But I mean, yeah, like we mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, just just everything in this game just so many systems at play so many systems at work and I do just really appreciate that the devs were like hey this is a lot why don't we make sure to give players the opportunity to practice this stuff and the combat simulator is such a great place to do that Mm -hmm. and it helps you unlock and earn things as well so it doesn't feel like you're just doing tutorials for the sake of learning which which is not a bad thing in a video game it's important you know to learn and know what you're doing But I kept in the beginning, like I knew that I was going to need to shake the rust off to Mm -hmm. get my groove back in using all of my different party members to their best ability and learning like how to use their individual spells and abilities without just feeling like I'm constantly out of ATB and um, MP all the time. I just feel like I don't get the opportunity to use those synergy skills a lot and I don't know if it's because I'm just spamming abilities and spells and so I'm I'm really running through all of my meters quickly because you need the meters full in order to use most of the synergy skills the, um, yeah the abilities so the abilities yeah. yeah as you look in your menu it'll show you how many charges you need and again to be clear for those listening this is separate from your ATB um ATB gauge. So, you know, you might, Cloud might execute two attacks of steel and that will fill his meter by two. And then Tifa to do that attack with him, she needs three bars or whatever. So you have to make sure you do attacks with Tifa that gives you those bars that you need. And then it will, then it'll become a thing. And your day to day 
mo- your day to day, like your monsters, your random little plebe ass monsters, like you're probably not going to need these, right? Unless you're playing on the hardest difficulty because you're not going to even have the time to build up the gauges you need to execute these skills. Right. But when you get to those big ass bosses, man, that's when they really, really come into play. So I would say it's probably a little bit of column A, column B, why you're not using them yet. Yeah. And also I mean, there's I, just so I, many I, systems. Like that's let's just like make that clear again. We haven't even talked about the materia, which we don't need to really go into too in depth, but that's a whole nother level of this. So just again, like I said at the top, be patient with yourself, friends, as you play it. It might seem like a lot at first, and it is, but it'll click eventually. And again, you can make it as simple or as difficult as you want it to be. I do appreciate that there's a lot of flexibility and ways that players get to really customize their experience. And I think that's a huge mm-hmm. step up in Rebirth from Remake. Like, I loved the combat combat and Remake, but you get to do so much more in Rebirth because you have so many more party members at your disposal for a lot of the gameplay experience. So you get to customize your party members that are with you, and they make it really easy to do within the menu system. So if you, you know, die at an encounter and you, you know, use the retry from the last battle move, am I saying that I use that a lot? I'm not saying that. You're saying that. I love that that it's built Um, in there. I love that. (laughs) Um, You can say, hey, maybe I don't want to bring Tifa into this encounter because this enemy has a lot of, like, close up attacks that she's just struggling with. Maybe I want to bring you know, like Arathin to be more mm-hmm. support or somebody else. And you can like change out your party members. And I love that because it lets you kind of on the fly change what your combat experience is going to be. And there wasn't as much of that in the last game because it kind of felt like your par- party was pretty locked based on the instance of the game you were in or which chapter or mission you were on. Yeah. And this one, there's just like a whole new world. <laughs> There are a lot of characters to to choose from. Yes, so many playable characters in this game. And like we saw in the gameplay trailer that Square put out, that like 11 minute gameplay trailer, they were just like, and look for this person and this person and this person. And there's also people that they, you know, haven't mentioned yet um, that you'll be able to discover. And I think that is both doing some amazing fan service for people who are familiar with the franchise, but also for people like me, it's like, oh, Maybe I just don't like playing with Daddy Cloud all the time. Maybe I, you know, want to play with somebody different. No, that's fair. That is totally fair. But you I, do you. I do like, I do like Cloud a lot. So that's not true know, for I me. Know. I just, I you know, know, hypothetically for somebody hypothetically. who weirdly doesn't like Cloud goes, who could not like Cloud? Oh, I love Cloud. He, he's such a dork. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's the thing of like, you know, we can make a video that's two hours long about this and talk about everything and anything. But I think... Uh, the way this game makes me feel is it's, it's kind of given me the since the first time I finished Final Fantasy IX, it's giving me, and that was when I was like 14, it's giving me those nostalgic feels of like that that fantasy of Final Fantasy, that magic. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's yes. just, this is how I think we all felt like Final Fantasy VII. And I mean, eight wasn't very like, eight and nine, I'll say that. I don't want people to get mad at me. Like se- seven, eight, and nine, this is what I think we all thought it looked like in our minds right you had the overworld you had all these different towns and this freedom to go and do what you want and like secrets to discover and I I just feel like this little giddy sense of nostalgia within me when when I was playing this game and it just made me feel like I was nine years old again you know what I mean like it's just like absolutely it just does something to me and I love it and you know bloating and pacing aside everything that's here it is just there's so much heart and spirit to it and I am just so thrilled with this game and um, I will be curious to see how other reviewers feel about it as well. You know, again, I think it's just going to depend on how people play it, but uh, I, I'm just absolutely in love with it. I love these characters. I love this story. I, I want to bang everybody except for Red. <laughs> That's weird. And Yuffie. But, you know, it's fine. Everyone is just great. Even Barrett, who I will admit I always thought was just, like, not not my favorite dude at all. I After playing Remake, he, he grew on me a little bit. And now in Rebirth, I'm like, you are one of my favorite people ever. You're like an onion, sir. There are so many levels to you that I just want to peel back and get to know. Big old softy. And he has the most beautiful, like, in-game eyeballs I've ever seen in my life. They're just yes. so kind and soft. And they're a beautiful color as well. But just the way, like, his emotions. Anyway, I'm I'm going off. But I'm so happy with this. And I want to say one more thing. Read Final Fantasy VII, Traces of Two Pasts. That is a book that is out now. And it talks a little bit about Tifa's backstory and Aerith's backstory. And if you read that, 
you will get some kicks and some additional context out of this video game. Ooh, how long is that book? Uh, I don't really know. I, I read it over the course of like a few weeks at night. It's okay. a couple hundred pages, but it's very good. It reads very easily. It's very fun. Well, good I was times. just like, how quickly could I read it, like pause my gameplay, but that's not going to happen. Oh, don't do that. Because no, now that. that I'm playing, all I want to do is keep playing. So, yeah. Brittany, to kind of mm -hmm. wrap up our thoughts on what we've played so far. Knowing that you had incredibly glowing things to say about Final Fantasy 16 last year, and that mm -hmm. game seemed pretty universally liked, but yeah. didn't break through the wild release schedule that was 2023. And I feel like Square Enix is looking at the Final Fantasy franchise with, you know, four, let's put 14 on its own island because it's, you know, like a live service MMO. Um, yeah going you know what do we keep reinvesting in this franchise what do fans want from this franchise how are we going to continue to make enough profit on this franchise to keep it going and not cancel it what do you think the answer is do you think rebirth delivers and is going to succeed potentially where 16 did not do you see what's behind me my dear that is a shrine <laughs> yes, to I final do. fantasy 9 there is a cloud and there's a sephiroth um i'm being silly for real. I think 16 was a fantastic game. I really enjoyed it. I will say, though, I never got around to finishing it because there there was something lacking from it that I want from a Final Fantasy game. And what that is, is it's what this game has, right? Like, when I play Final Fantasy, I want to be transported back to my childhood. And this delivers. And I think what we're going to see is that's what a lot of people really loved. I know 15 too. I love 15, but it was based a little too much in reality. And I think it maybe you shouldn't click with a lot of folks because of maybe the character lineup or whatever. I personally loved it. Was it was the car, right? And people it, didn't yeah, like that it. was the one. The, the car and just like the, the Choka Bros. Like, yeah, people, whatever. It's a fantastic game and I will die on that hill. And I will tell everybody they should absolutely play it. And it's not a little kitty game, goddammit. Um, but no, but it was like, missing I, the fantasy part of the final fantasy. It, was, it had more fantasy than 16. And my, oh, don't, I don't want to open that can of worms. I don't want to go there. <laughs> I don't want to go there. Um, okay, so answer your question bluntly. I think whether where Square is going to see the most success. Obviously, like I, I truly believe if they were to remake Final Fantasy IX, I think that's going to sell like fucking gangbusters because I think what they're seeing is that these games, even though they were freaking fantastic for the time, seven, eight, nine back in the day, and all, even obviously the older ones too. But like we'll pin that conversation for another time that they can be expanded upon in such a way that makes sense. Now, do they have to do the cuckoo bananas multiple timeline shenaniganry that we're toying with with these ones? No, they can just do a one-to-one -one remake, especially for a game like Final Fantasy IX. Um, so I hope they continue to go that route, remake the originals, kind of like what Res we've seen Resident Evil do, but then they need to get their footing with where, where the series goes going forward. And I hope they go back to their roots and do another brand new original story, set it in the fantasy setting, give us the chocobos and the moogles, and give us what we feel like Final Fantasy is. And I don't want them to only rely on the remakes, air quotes, for that sense of wonder. Um, and that was one of my complaints with 16, is that it just didn't have that fantasy element of it. Where were the moogles? Where were... You know, the, the magic of it all, it just was very almost like non-existent in my opinion. Fantastic game. Fantastic action game. Don't get me wrong. Beautiful. I love the characters and the, the wild ass story, but it wasn't the Final Fantasy game that I wanted. So I'm hoping going forward again, create something brand new. The series has a lot of legs and that's that's what I want. So Square, hire me. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> don't let me don't let me do any of your music or sing in any of your songs because I'll ruin everything but narratively <laughs> like let's do this <laughs> I love it well we're excited to hear what you guys think about Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth thank you again to Square Enix for providing us early access to the game and codes and I am excited to play more and fully anticipate having to text you multiple times to be like what the heck is going on I'm so confused. Story of my life. You should see how many notes I have in my phone that are nothing but question marks and exclamation points. I love this. I love yes. this for us. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening and or watching. And don't forget, Friday's episode will be up on Friday. See you then. Bye.